so are we, so you still uh, still set so now we're live um so now if we need someone to confirm our existence and then we'll know that we're actually live to the to the youtube audience so generally that take doesn't take too long but but uh who are you what do you do my name is uh, is Klaus von Tobeden, and uh, and I'm the uh, JWST project scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And so, just to remind folks, that's the uh, organization that uh, is contracted by NASA to operate space telescopes, including the Hubble Space Telescope, but in the near future, also the James Webb Space Telescope. And so, so that's my capacity there. That's going to be uh, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, we've been all fairly familiar that STS. Hold on, S S T S C I S T S C I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I wish I wish there would have been a, a better, you know, a snappier yeah, we, acronym for that. No, I know, but I, you know, whenever we're doing credits, right? You know, like you know, image credit, NASA, S T S C I. You know, whatever, um, or ESA, NASA, ESA, S T S C I. Um, but yeah, so so how like how do you interact with with Hubble? How does this exactly work? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so Hubble has been around for, for more than 30 years, um, and we have a tremendous amount of expertise in the building and in, in operating Hubble, right? And operating means, you know, anything, you know, end to end, anything for, from, you know, helping the community to uh, to do the observations, to do the science they need to do, to, to actually scheduling a telescope, to produce, uh, reducing or uh, the data and archiving them, you know, in a public archive. And so, so, Lots of folks have been through this whole thing for, for many years. Um, and so we have we've taken a lot of advantage in, in, in James Webb land in, you know, taking the parts of, of Hubble that 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 worked really well, but also, uh, you know, taking some of the lessons learned um, and trying to improve those. Um, and so so we've been working very closely with, with Hubble folks and we have you know, a lot of people from from Hubble land transferred over and now working on right on the JWST side of things. Right. So just to sort of be specific about this, right? Like, like there's a schedule for who gets to use Hubble when. And and you're the group that manage that schedule, right? That's right. Yeah. And so and and the thing that I th I think most people don't realize is that access to the Hubble Space Telescope is free to the entire astronomical community worldwide. That's right. Yeah, and that's right. And so then you just need to make your case of the science that you're looking to do, ask the time, and then they'll you'll put people on the schedule. So what is the backlog right now? How, how far forward is the schedule filled for the Hubble Space Telescope? Uh, so, so the way it works. So, just 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 let me clarify a little bit. You asked me to be to be so specific. Yes. Uh, so, we, we manage the process that that decides who gets time. Now, there's always many more uh, folks out outside in, in the world uh, who, with with ideas um, than we have time for. Right. So, it's always oversubscribed. So, there's a competitive process. Now, we don't um, we don't at the STSCI we we don't decide who mm -hmm. gets time. The community decides. Yes, so it, it's peer reviewed. So we have a panel get together from you know out in the community, and they look at all the proposals and they decide which which ones have the most scientific merit. Um, and so that's done yearly. Um, sometimes there's a little there's there's some extra calls for proposals, but typically it's ev once every year, and we call those cycles. And it's the same for web. So a year in advance. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Um, we're going to build to the web question, but we'll we'll get there. How many? Hubbles, do you think there could be to it, to sort of properly fulfill the legitimate science demand for that telescope? Like if you could just duplicate Hubble many times, how many times until it started to sort of run out of jobs? Oh gosh, <laughs> uh, I, I find it incredible that after more than thirty years, uh, Hubble is still oversubscribed the time uh, by a factor of eight or so. Eight. Uh, so you yeah. get eight, um, you know, ten just to be safe. You get ten more Hubbles just right. to be safe, right? Right. And 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 we even we've had like Hubble is 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 you know it's it's a great observatory in the sense that we've had several Hubbles because they have changed the instrumentation on them. So the Hubble today is way more capable than the first Hubble that was launched. Right. Um, and and so I mean it is kind of a, a tricky question. We always sort of have this conversation about like would astronomers be happier with a James Webb or many more 
Hubble's and based on the level of, of and I know it's a different instrument answers a different question but just like the level of, like there's clearly massive demand for more powerful space telescopes yeah um well I'm certainly hoping that that that, that people would choose the the next generation you know as you say because it can answer questions that you just couldn't possibly do with with Hubble um, it does have overlapping capabilities with Hubble. So, you know, maybe think of it more as uh, like we, we put new instruments on Hubble to be able to do new things. So this is just the next step we're taking. Right? We, we, we can still take uh, web goes down to wavelengths that overlap with, with Hubble's wavelengths. So we can still do Hubble-like imaging, uh, just better. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So then, then let's talk about how this this sort of overall process of booking time on a telescope, this applies over to James Webb. And so for the last couple of years, as 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 I had been sort of watching the the news coming out of NASA, they were talking about calls for proposals from scientists. And these have been gathering for a couple of years now. So when did this process wrap up this first run? So yeah, so so it's actually this the there's been a no number of, of opportunities before, even for web, but this was the big one. Um, and so uh, the, the the deadline for submitting proposals was last November. Mm -hmm. and, and then there has been a process that takes months to evaluate all the proposals and select them. And and the selection was made just about a month ago, the final announcement of that selection. So right. it took, you know, four or five months. Yeah, and, and that was sort of my... That was sort of why I, I invited someone from NASA to come and, and talk about this because I felt like, okay, we've got now a pretty good sense of of what science targets James Webb is going to be observing. So how many targets have you got in the schedule? Roughly. Oh, you don't have to tell wow. me. Like, even to, to, yeah. to an order of magnitude if you need. <laughs> like, um, All right, so there are... Um, uh, if you if you count both the the the, the final set of proposals that were announced now as well as the guaranteed uh, time observations which were defined a while ago by you know, by the people who designed built instruments, uh, we have almost four hundred individual proposals for the first year. Um, so each of them have at least one target, uh, but many of them have more. Right. So right. so I'm guessing of order a thousand. Right. And so you've got so that's just interesting. So so roughly each person gets the telescope for about a day, like a little, you know, obviously a little less than a day. And some people get many days and other people get five minutes. <laughs> but, and, and what is the slack time? Like, like, is that telescope just going to be rolling from target to target to target, like nonstop? Yeah, basically. Um, uh, so yeah, no, nobody gets five minutes because it is still, uh, you know, it's still an aircraft carrier and it takes time to move. Uh, but yes, uh, it, the design of, of, of web is really made such that it observes 24 seven. Um, we, we count, uh, 8,760 hours in a year. That's the total number of hours available. And those are available for, for observing. Um, some of that time is used like a few hundred hours is used for calibration, but the rest is really available to, uh, to scientific investigations. So, yeah, so it does go from, from target to target to target. And the, uh, there are some innovation as well in the way that it's scheduled in the sense that, uh, uh, we don't we don't have contact with the telescope all the time so it's robotic so let's say you're observing a target um and something goes wrong with that target you know maybe the observer put it in the wrong position i mean hopefully that doesn't happen very much but you know something can go wrong um the telescope will not just sit there and wait until it gets instruction it'll just drop it and go to the next one wow so so it, it's really meant to be um to be highly efficient and and I'm assuming, like you know, my experience with a telescope. After a while, you go, you know what? I'm going to spend some time in Cassiopeia today. I'm going to work in this region because these targets are all relatively close. So I'm assuming that as you went through, you optimized the targets so that they minimize the slew time to be able to to observe everything. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It's a bit of a traveling salesman problem. Um, yeah. Uh, it's like not 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 just the distance between the targets, but if you cannot you also can't observe the entire sky at any given moment. You have to make sure that the telescope is always in shade, 
can never see the sun. And so that limits the, uh, the, the what we call the field of regard to the part of the sky that you can observe at any given time. Yeah, so, so that's why it's important as well to have all the programs in, all the targets in all at once so that the scheduling system can, can look at all of them at that as an ensemble and make sure that it's, it's, that its path on the sky is optimal in terms of time it takes to slow. And, and how does its ability to, to sort of observe the sky different from Hubble? Like Hubble, of course, is in low Earth orbit. It's, there's this ob large object in the way, um, as well as the sun, as well as the moon. James Webb is really far away from the Earth. It has no atmospheric disturbance. You know, it's a one and a half million kilometers away. How does that change the amount of observing time you can do? Yes, yeah, so it's roughly a factor. I mean, compared to Hubble, it's roughly a factor of two, right? Because as you say, Hubble is in low Earth orbit, so half the time it's it's on the sun side and can't observe. Um, whereas that's not the case for Webb. So yes, yeah, so we get about a factor of two more more um, hours in the sky, and so to fill out the whole uh, the whole year. That's kind of, that's really amazing that that you've got that. I mean, it's that advantage. It's why so many spacecraft are going out to that Lagrange point so far away from the Earth. The downside is you can't send astronauts to fix it. The upside is more observing time. That's right. That's yeah. right. There are many. It's a, for an infrared telescope like Webb, you also you need a thermally very stable environment. You can't have this kind of like uh, Hubble has a lot of issues with with uh, thermal cycling. Right, so it gets hot, it gets cold. Um, out at out at L two. Uh, uh, it's far enough away. It's just very quiet, um, and we can always see web, right? So we can communicate with it all the time. It's not it doesn't go. You know, we don't have to change, uh, you know, context. Yeah, that's really handy. All right, so let's so let's talk about some of the some of the targets. So what is like the what would you say is like the the big one for the, you know, when I think about Hubble, you know, I think of some of the landmark work that Hubble did. The big one, of course, is the deep field survey um what is what is sort of an equivalent really big science question that hubble is going to be spending quite a, a lot of time asked you know answering um you mean sorry, james webb yeah yeah sorry yeah james yeah. Webb. yeah um yeah so so, so there, there's a there's a number you can think of you know, of course it's going to do deep fields right the way the, the reason it was originally designed was to do deep fields but better than better than hubble to really get to the to the first galaxies Right. So the, the issue with Hubble was always, and they knew that from the very beginning, uh, that if you have a have a telescope that mostly works in the visible a little bit in the infrared, but not very far, um, galaxy, the first galaxies are are far enough away that the light is redshifted enough that it's just most of it is out of the, the wavelength range of Hubble. And so we'll get those with James Webb. And so uh, a, a quite significant amount of time is spent on doing deep fields. And not just doing uh, doing imaging of those deep fields to to get images of the first galaxies, but also uh, to to take spectra at the same time of them to to get a precise measurement of their distance redshift, uh, and and as well and also the precise measurement of how much how you know how rapidly they're forming stars and so on. Um, so so that will be very exciting in the sense that, that that fulfills a promise that was made back in the mid '90s of, of building this telescope. Um, but the second part that that has been that has come up is, is very exciting is is of course the uh, the characterization of exoplanet atmospheres and in particular uh, the ones that are relatively low mass low, low enough mass that they're rock they have a rocky surface like the Earth uh, like one of the big questions that are, that are that is ongoing is um, we, we it's easiest to observe the atmospheres of exoplanets that are around stars that are lower mass than the sun or cooler than the sun, so M dwarfs. Um, but a lot of folks have been saying, well, they don't have any atmospheres because M dwarfs, they're really active stars and they have these big flares and they blow off the atmospheres. And so maybe these are not actually good places for life. So, so James Webb will actually be able to pick the, the best ones of those and that's in the in the uh, plan um, and and go ahead and measure if they have an atmosphere or not. So, so, I, that, that very funny. so I mean, I, I want to split those those two ideas that you talked about, I want to start with the the deep field survey and just get a sense of context here, like, like Hubble pointed at, you know, the first for the first deep field they pointed, I think it was in Ursa Major, there was like a, you know, find a part that of the sky that has no galaxies, and then just stare at it for longer and longer time period. And then with the second one, I think they went into Fornax, and same with the ultra deep field and same thing, they just went for as, as they just went for hours and hours and hours and more and more objects. So 
so how long will James Webb do its first version of its deep field? Like how long is it going to be staring at one spot of the sky? If you know roughly again, or does it? Um, yes. Yeah, so I, I do. I, I, the, the surveys are set up in a, uh, they usually do like a lay, what they call a layer cake, right? So they do a very wide, shallow survey and then a, then a smaller, deeper one. Um, I, I don't think any of them uh, have the same depth as the, all, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field in terms of time. Mm. Uh, but of course, Webb is much, much faster, so it will go deeper than than Hubble did. And so I think you'll see in cycle one, you'll see well, when it's not going to get anywhere near what it will ultimately do because we're going to try first to see, you know, let's take the first step. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll go, uh, you know, two, three, four times as deep as, as Hubble did uh, and see what we find before we design the, the next one. So that's, oh, that's the strategy they have taken. Yeah. yeah, and I know, like, I mean, with Hubble, a lot of the, the best things that it's been able to observe have required gravitational lenses that you get these lucky shots where galaxy clusters can act as a natural lens to observe some object that's farther behind. But with, with James Webb, you can just brute force your way right out to the to anything that Hubble could see in this sort of lucky way. Right. That's right. That's right. But that doesn't mean that we can't do clusters too. Right? So, <laughs> so, so Webb will do that too. It'll, it'll, it'll do both. The, okay, let, let, let's get the boost from having a bigger telescope and go to the infrared so we get most of the light. But then let's also go to the cluster and get an extra boost there. Um, and so the, the, the promise was, oh, even without the cluster, you would be able to go and look for the first galaxies. But once you have a cluster, you, you might actually get lucky. And uh, it's a long shot, but you might get lucky uh, to, to, to look for the first stars, like these super massive population, three stars, if you have a very, very lucky gravitational lens alignment, it's something you might pick up. That, uh, that's really interesting. So I hadn't heard that, right? Of course, with James Webb, you're going to be able to see out to these first galaxies that are that are coming together. But there's still this chunk of of the unknown from the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is like 370,000 years after the Big Bang, through to those first galaxies. You've got this gap in between, and that's still that big question, as you said, are those those first stars were they a hundred times the mass of the sun? Were they a hundred thousand times the mass of the sun. I mean, we still don't know what they looked like. And so you think that possibly with a gravitational lens, you might be able to, to observe some of these. There, 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 there have been uh, 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 discussions about that. And I believe there's some programs that will try and do it. That's really cool. I see this is the kind of stuff that I wanted to I wanted to hear because I know like there's like some follow on telescopes proposed like Louvoir and uh, Origins that perhaps could could see these first stars. But it, but it, but it's sort of I guess it's sort of the way of things that you get. The first thing is like Hubble gives you a hint that a thing is there and then you follow up with a more specific telescope. Will the will the Will the levels of infrared that James Webb is able to see be able to see those stars? Are they starting to shift into the into the microwave at that point? Um, well, not, not yeah, not quite. You, you can with the with the wavelength coverage of Webb, you can go you can go quite quite far right. So the uh, I mean, you can do a back of the envelope calculation. It's sort of the edge edge you get. Um, at around the uh, uh, Lyman Alpha, right? So point one micron. Uh, you, you you can go out to about five micron with uh, with very high sensitivity with uh, with near cam, for example. Um, and so uh, that's a redshift of tens, right, to get to right. to still be able to get light. So so I don't think there's going to be a limit there. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Um, that's great. I I had no idea, so I'm really quite pleased. All right, let's talk about the exoplanets then and the exoplanet atmospheres, as you mentioned. So, of course. You know, Spitzer, which was an infrared observatory, um, Herschel, an infrared observatory, those have been able to observe exoplanetary atmospheres. Um, what will, like, how will James Webb be able to to do this work and be able to observe atmospheres? Right. So, so it really uses the same techniques. I mean, so these tried and true techniques, but once you have, once you have this big, big mirror, uh, uh, you can do, you, you can do it so much faster. But you can also you can do it to higher precision. Um, 
so that uh, you know the, what, the way they do it really is they get they 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 do the the transits as well as the eclipse. Right, so the transit is where the planet goes in front of the star. The eclipse is where it goes behind. So when it goes behind, you get a dip from the, the that you, you you lose out the light that's actually coming from the planet itself, not just what it blocks from the star, which I find very exciting. So you can do a lot of that in once you go out into the mid infrared. Uh, where you'd see the thermal emission from the planet itself. And so Spitzer did some of that too. Webb will do uh, several full phase curves where they follow the planet all the way around. So you can get the phases, right? So when it's, it's, it's like half moon. Wow. To new moon, to full moon. Oh, that's amazing. Um, right. And yeah, and me- measure the temperature distribution on the surface. Uh, so th- I think that that's, uh, that's very exciting. So really it's using the same techniques, but, but taking the next step. Um, also, in, when you do the transit, um, you, you get the, the, the signatures of the, uh, of the different molecules in the atmosphere, you know, whether it's water or, you know, something else, methane. Uh, when you do higher precision, it, 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 it's much easier and, and, and a wider wavelength range. It's much easier for the models to, to fit that spectrum to work out how much there actually is of each each molecule. If you have a very noisy spectrum, you might say, oh, there's maybe some water there, but we don't know how much. And so it's limited how much it, it tells you. So, so you really take the step from knowing it's there, right? knowing that molecule is there to actually having and make building an atmosphere model, right? right? Getting an understanding of, wow, you know, it's at this height uh, and it's above that and there are clouds here and Right. And so you get this this picture of, a, of, a, of an actual planet with uh, with with weather and climate. Now, I mean, the the method that 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 Spitzer used, you know, they, they take the the chemical signature of the star plus planet, then take the chemical signature of the of the star, subtract and you get the atmosphere of the planet. So you're not you're not directly observing the planet, you're, you're sort of inferring its atmosphere indirectly. But will James Webb, you know, you're talking about phases, so will James Webb be directly imaging exoplanets separate uh, from their star? Yeah, yeah, yes and yes, I mean, it depends on how, how, you, how you interpret it. First of all, yes, there will be, there's also direct imaging, right? So where you, where you actually take an image, you have an image of the star and you have an image of the planet. So it'll be some of that. It's a bit different than what I talked about before, but, but we all, I also typically think of once you have, uh, once you do the, the eclipse and then phase curves, because they, when you go out in the infrared, you actually see the self emission of the planet, even though you don't resolve the two. Uh, uh, you're still you're still detecting the uh, the uh, directly measuring the photons from the planet itself. So I consider that in the same same category. But yes, there is there are, there are, there are several coronagraphs on on the observatory uh, across a wide range of wavelengths, and um, and so there will be imaging, and that's also in the program of planets. Um, there will be you know much much wider orbits, uh, and typically again there will be the ones that are known. Uh, but there's several programs that will look for 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 new planets, and I think one of the things that that you can really do with Web is you can look for young planets, in particular planets that are still embedded in the protoplanetary disks out of which they're forming, or the debris disk out of which they're forming, and you can you can pick out the young planets because they're still hot, and of course in the infrared you see that you see the hot things. So again, there are several programs will try and they'll look for at disks that have structures that you see either in, in previous uh, uh, imaging or in, in, in microwave imaging with ALMA, you see, you see gaps in them or other structures that indicate that there's a planet in there that, that have interacted with a disk. And so uh, Webb will go and take a high contrast imaging in the, in the mid infrared and see if we can see the self emission from the planet inside the gap. That's that's really cool. I mean, I think the the issue, of course, is that we're always still working in extremes. That you're seeing, as you say, you know, newly forming planets that are molten rock, not a very habitable place. Um, you're looking at uh, planets around red dwarf stars, which are known to be fairly aggressive and and flare happy. Um, so will we be able to get closer to that that holy grail with with James Webb being able to observe the atmosphere of an Earth-like planet? Um, yeah, no, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get closer. We won't quite get there with Webb. Um, I mean, there's always a reason to build the next the next big observatory, but but I think we'll get we'll get a lot closer. We'll take more than one just one step toward that. We'll take multiple steps, right? And so, 
I think we're just not going to be quite able to um, to to get all the parameters right. So we'll get get an Earth-sized planet, but it'll be around an M, uh, a red dwarf, right? Uh, or or we'll get we'll get a planet around a, 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 that that may have a rocky surface around something. It's a little bit more like the sun, but it won't be as small as the Earth. It will still be bigger. Um, you know, it won't be at the in, in the orbit that uh, that that uh, enables liquid water. It won't be an inhabitable zone. So I don't. I, th I think we'll, we'll get sort of a, you know you want you want three things right to get something that you might consider um, Earth like. Uh, we'll pick, we'll get two out of those three with web. And we'll hang, we'll need something else to get all three lined up. Right. But we'll take big steps. Yeah, and I, I think it's important because, I mean, I think we even saw with the controversy about the possible biosignatures seen at Venus with this idea of seeing phosphine. Like, Venus is, is just, it's right over there. And yet, it was really tricky with some of the best telescopes on Earth to tease out this signal. I mean, how much could we possibly hope for for a yeah. star that is multiple light years away and yet it's the most fundamental question we can ask ourselves so it's absolutely you know why not and i would also I would, I would caution against you know listening too much to me trying to make predictions here in this because you know we don't you know we, we I, i'm sure that that the, the the greatest things we'll see about x we'll find we'll just discover about exoplanets we have no idea we can sit here and talk about it until the end of days you know we need we need yeah. the data before we can tell yeah of course if you go back through you know you look at the original science case for hubble these are the things these are the questions that hubble is expected to answer and then you compare that up against all the stuff that hubble did discover it just doesn't even compare so um so then i guess what else caught your eye when you were reviewing the various proposals that scientists were made, you know, ones that seemed very clever and will answer some really interesting scientific questions, do you think? Um, yeah, so, well, one thing I was really struck by is how broad the science is, that, that, that there are clever ideas and almost that touches almost any any uh, field of astrophysics and planetary science. Don't you forget that, that we are... <laughs> We're not just observing exoplanets, but also uh, objects within the solar system, right? So there are programs that will search for uh, and characterize um, hyperbuilt objects. Uh, Web will be really good at at getting spectra of uh, you know smaller Plutos, kind of like, and and, and measure what their surface is made 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 of, like what kind of ices are there. Um, I, I took particularly note also, and so this is also something that I, we weren't even talking about it for a couple of years ago, and that is uh, that is proposals to um, uh, to pick up kilonova. Kilonova are the uh, the, the neutron neutron mergers mm -hmm. that give rise mm -hmm. to the gravitational wave detections we've seen, right? And so I think we just started to scratch the surface of picking up the the optical and infrared counterparts of those. Those are important because. The neutron-neutron mergers are probably a significant source of heavy elements in the universe, things like gold. Um, and, but the way you figure out what, you know, what elements are actually being produced is you've got to go and take an infrared spectrum and you've got to monitor it over time. And you need a big, super sensitive infrared telescope to do that. So then there are several proposals that, ha that have what we call target of opportunity programs to go follow up. So you have a gravitational wave detection. Uh, so to actually go within a few days with the web and try and take a spectrum of the uh, of the object, uh, so I find that very 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 exciting. It's something you couldn't you couldn't do at all um, today without web. It's but it's sort of like somebody showing up at the like somebody getting a priority. It's like someone showing up at, at emergency, and you're kind of like going, okay, you know, we were doing this big long observation, but Kilanova, turn the telescope. Yep. Let's take a look. How how long? I mean, I sort of think about the brightness of the Kilanova, and then it's sort of the, the visible flash is over and then it's starting to cool down as the debris is flying out into space. How how long of a window will James Webb be a very useful telescope to make those kinds of observations? Like, do you have, is it weeks, years? Um, yeah, so the, the, the programs look look at these objects, the planes look at them over hundreds of days. Um, and uh, modeling indicates that you, you will have several sort of brightening peaks um, as the uh, as sort of the, this is fireball expands, um, and you go through different phases of, of dust formation and whatnot. Uh, so hundreds of days, but but they do want to pick it up after only a few days. There's some important um, lessons to be learned already there. 
Um, and you're right that that is to web to the web schedule that's very disruptive for us right so we only actually offer a few of those where you, where you just you know, drop everything you're doing you're probably going to lose the previous observation right but you know you got to get to this within a few days a super so what are some other examples i'm then then a kilanova what else what else would make james webb drop everything and and contribute an observation um well, as so I can tell you, one, one other example is probably not going to be a disruptive one, but who knows? Um, uh, and that is uh, the next time we have an interstellar comet come through. Okay, so like Oumuamua or, or Borisov. Yeah, yeah, for sure that, that you know, uh, <laughs> we'll go for that one, right? Because again, Webb is, when you have an infrared telescope that's just this, this spectroscopic powerhouse, it is, you can, you can take that and you can, you can tell what molecules are there. So right, if you get you, the molecular fingerprints, I mean, you probably still. I mean, is are there plans to try and make an observation of Oumuamua with James Webb, or is it is it just too far now, even for Webb at this point? Oh, Oumuamua, I, mean, yeah, I think it's too it's 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 too faint even for Webb. Right, you got to wait for the next one to come through. Okay, well, I I, I saw a calculation. There's something like seven within one AU of the sun at all times. So it's just a matter of finding them. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, so then let's say that you did see an object, Borisov or Muamua, passing through the solar system, and you turned the James Webb on this object. What could you learn about it that we hadn't learned with the best telescopes that we had at our disposal with Oumuamua or, or Borisov? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, yeah, it's one thing, size. Uh, and geometry, right? So again, if you if you look at it in the if you look at any sort of minor solar system object in the infrared, um, you will see it's a, 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 or at long enough wavelength anyway, you you'll see self emission, and that scales with the size. So so it really breaks it down. You learn how big it is. Uh, but but as I said, the composition as well. And so if it's really a comet um, and it it sublimates off water, you'd also get what other uh, molecular con constituents it's, it has in it, and you can compare that to solar system comets. And right? you can say, well, there's an interstellar comet. Does that actually look like a solar system comet? You might be able to look for, uh, for organics, more complex organics in it, right? So carbohydrates. Um, and so you learn something. We, we know from the solar system that, you know, probably the water on the Earth was delivered, you know, at least in some part from comets, uh, but maybe also a lot of the carbon we have, uh, other, other, other important elements for life. Does it happen in other solar systems and in what proportion? There's, there's only, I mean, you, you can't go there. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a really unique opportunity to get a comet from another solar system and measure the composition of it just in situ. Yeah, yeah, and it really is the universe throwing samples our way to, yeah. to study because we, I mean, we so far we only have a sample size of one, which is just all of the, the, the debris material that we have inside the solar system. And so we just, we don't know if the solar system is normal, if there's something really special about the solar system that helped develop life here, or if it's completely average and we're going to see the same stuff everywhere we go. Um, so one of the powers of infrared is the ability to peer through gas and dust. And of course, thanks to infrared observatories, we've been able to see into newly forming planetary systems. We've been able to look through the gas and dust that obscures the core of the Milky Way. We know what the great attractor is, thanks to infrared. Uh, so so tell me about some, some of the things that James Web will be doing looking through dust at objects that were previously obscured to our point of view. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So you're right that a lot of that was has been done. Uh, say, for example, with Spitzer, right? But Spitzer was uh, it was an 85 centimeter telescope. Um, so the way I'm thinking of it is really, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, when when we look at star formation and planet formation, we want to understand our own origins and the origins of, of exoplanets and their composition. For the solar system, we were pretty sure that, that the sun formed in a very active environment, um, like with lots of massive uh, young stars near, nearby that with the, had this harsh radiation that probably blew off, off um, the, the solar nebula, the disk, the planet forming disk around the sun relatively quickly. Uh, with Spitzer, when, in the past, when we have looked at storm planet formation, we've looked at very nearby objects. Uh, because it just didn't have the sensitivity for it. With Webb, we can do the uh, you know a similar kind of design study, but we can go we can go all the way to the galactic center and do the same kind of thing. Uh, we can look in 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 um, massive clusters that are much more typical of, of the typical star forming 
Like most stars are formed in these much, much bigger, harsher environments. And so that program is to go and go and go and do that. And so try to understand, you know, what is the lifetime of a planet forming disk in this kind of environment compared to this very quiescent backyard uh, that we have looked at so far. Um, so so that, 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 that's an important aspect of it. Um, uh, in terms of looking through dust, yes. Um, so, so that's important to see to see the earliest uh, stars. But I always want to emphasize that um, to web the dust is not just in the way, right? The dust contains uh, all the primordial material, whether that's water or other things that that you know you need to make make life. So we're actually interested in the dust itself. And again, we can use this powerful spectroscopic capabilities of web to understand the composition of the dust and follow it, you know, from a cloud and as it forming a star, as it goes into a planet forming disk, and then eventually as it goes into planets and we can compare to the planet atmosphere composition of exoplanets and follow, follow the water, follow the organics all the way. Right. You know, I, I didn't ask at the beginning, what was your specific area of, of research when you, I guess, you know, your, your most recent, like, what are you writing papers about? Or ha the last time you wrote a paper? Uh, yeah, no, so I, I, I'm interested in so, so what I was just talking about. So the origins of, uh, of, of, of life forming chemistry, right? right? Or the origins of the composition of planets. Um, so I like to look at, at water and organics, and but I, and, and whether that's in 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 dense clouds where the water is first forming um, in very cold regions, but then follow it through um, the star the star formation process into the into the disks. I'm interested in using web to look at planet forming disks and measure. You can do that and right? measure the composition of this planet forming material, um, and, and and really understand how it's delivered into into exoplanets. Right. Um... I mean, it's always kind of amazing the quantity of organic chemicals, you know, that are being found in all of these places. These, it's, they're finding them in comets. They're finding them on the surface of, of Titan. They're finding them out in cold molecular clouds that the building blocks of life just, just keep showing up everywhere that we look. And so it feels like, like those coming together in some useful way here on Earth feels inevitable. It's so, sort of, it's an interesting question, though, because um, it, it's, if you look at something like carbon, for example, uh, it's actually incredibly rare on the Earth. And it's sort of been a long standing mystery. Uh, carbon is super common in, in the universe, as you know, but not on the Earth. It's only about one out of a thousand of every carbon atom that actually that were originally available that made it to the Earth's surface. If we had, so there's some process that prevented it from coming from, from getting here. And we don't have a good understanding of that yet, right? Because carbon can exist as uh, in, a, in a molecular form that is very volatile. If it's like carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, um, it doesn't condense out. And so you wouldn't, it wouldn't end up on a planet at, at one AU like the Earth. But it can also exist in this incredibly hardy environment, uh, in these hardy molecular structures like, like soot. Right. So we have a lot of soot in, 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 in the universe. Um, and that takes thousands of degrees to get, get into, the, into the gas phase of, of a solid. Um, and so how much made it to the Earth depends on this ratio of how much is in soot versus how much is in carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. And we don't quite understand that balance. So, so it's, it's not inevitable. Um, nitrogen is even worse on the Earth. It's only one of a million that made it to the Earth. Right. So you, something that happened that made 10 times less nitrogen make it to the Earth, we wouldn't be here. And but I mean, when I think about planets that maybe have much more carbon, that could cause problems as well in terms of of creating carbon dioxide and, and other stuff. So is it, so then maybe does that make the chances for habitability less? likely or more likely i'm just trying to think about which way you would would go i guess more observations with james webb will really help but um like yeah you know like, i mean i mean we suffer a little bit from the anthropic principle here on earth i mean obviously yeah. life is here because it happened to have the right the right uh, uh happenstance uh so you mean if you have more carbon you maybe what happens is just you move the habitable zone out right? you, can, you can have a warm planet at, larger distances. Right. So okay. okay. I don't know if it makes it more or less likely, but it, it definitely changes things.
Um, all right, so I'm gonna take some questions from the audience here. There's a lot of great questions. So Arjon asks, how long will it take to get real science done versus just figuring out the quirks of the telescope? Ah, uh, good question. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we, re we really want science to get done as quickly as possible. It takes, it, uh, from launch, it takes six months to commission a telescope. We're not doing really any science for those six months. It's taking all the time just to, to focus the mirror and, and making sure the instruments work. But then at the end of the commissioning, at the end of those six months, we just start doing science uh, pretty much nonstop. Um, and then it, it and, and, and we deliver data, you know, as soon as it's taken, it takes, you know, maybe a day or so to get to the PI to, to start working on. How long will it take them to get a paper out? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I suspect that there will be some people who will have papers almost almost pre-written and just drop, <laughs> drop in the data. And just done. waiting and for the data to go it. in. Oh, yeah. Oh, that. Uh, you know, maybe take 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 some very early results with a grain of salt. Uh, uh, so so well, it, it remains to be seen. But I, I think we're gonna we're gonna see results within a few few weeks of uh, of science operations starting. So at the end of the six months right. commissioning period. Um, and then we're just going to have have a have a steady stream of results. Yeah, I mean, I know we get some of those first light images, and but that's like NASA just going. We took a picture. It's probably a galaxy. We don't really have any additional information to tell you. And it's of course the actual science papers that come out where people are taking the pictures and doing the work and and making the science results before we start to see that. Um, but I think it's great. So uh, Ben Kilo asks, are JWST's uh, gyros and reaction wheels any more robust than past telescopes? Does it have thrusters? Um, yeah, so uh, two, two things there. Um, uh, so, so, so yes, uh, um, reaction wheel gyros are, are more, more robust than they used to be. And even, even for Hubble, uh, there's this new generation of those. So, so that's not a, it's not so much of a concern. Um, it, it web does have thrusters. Um, so that's a, that's a different matter. It is that um, because it has this big sun shield, um, the solar radiation actually exerts enough pressure on it as it goes through its observing schedule that it starts to turn the whole the whole observatory, and it, that that um, angular momentum uh, gets taken up by reaction wheel. But at some point, it just gets to its limit of of, of performance, and you have to spin it back down with a burn. Of, of a thruster and that that's that's ultimately the the life limiting aspect is, is the amount of propellant available on the observatory for those um for those burns and um, yeah. and you actually use a different technology for the reaction wheels or for, for actually pointing so i know with with hubble you have the gyroscopes and you have the reaction wheels but on james webb they're using like an uh, i forget what it is it's like a it's a scintillating crystal method to actually maintain the the target. It's like a different yeah, yeah, and, and 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 for for Hubble, it's also anyway. So Hubble does not have have thrusters because uh, it can actually it also picks up um, angular momentum, but can can get rid of it by connecting to the Earth's magnetic field. Which is one that's not 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 that well known, I think. Uh, so we can't do that on L two. That's why we have the, the thrusters. So that's the downside of being so far away from the Earth is you can't yeah. use the Earth's magnetic field to reorient <laughs> your telescope. That's crazy. Right. That's amazing. Right. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, uh, and then Hal McKinney asks: Is there enough room in the Lagrange point for JWST to share with other future telescopes? Uh, good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, are, there are a few out there, uh, but uh, it's a huge, it's a huge area. Um, so that's not a, that's not a concern. It's, 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 it's. Uh, it actually doesn't. It's not a. When it goes to L two, it's not. It doesn't sit in a single point. I mean, L two is a point in space, but it actually orbits that point. So that's this giant orbit. It takes about six months to do an orbit around the L two. Um, so it's it's a big area. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, Although it's it's it is a little different, like with the L four and the L five, because they are gravity wells, you can orbit a giant region. But with L two, you want to get you want to get as close as you can to the the minimum amount of gravity well to maintain that that position. So you're going to be a yeah. little closer for sure. But um, but then you've got the interactions of the Earth and the Sun and the Moon. It's just it's a shifting blob to try and stay inside. Yeah, so it's a little <clears throat> wobbly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So now, of course, we know that n 
that no matter what, no more delays, uh, James Webb is going to be launching uh, at the end of October um, for sure. Um, but let's say, hypothetically, uh, there is some kind of, of schedule delay. How badly does that mess up the schedule of objects that people are have already sort of, that you guys have already locked down that first scheduling run? Uh, yeah, so I, the, the, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect any kind of, of, uh, of change in schedule to actually affect the science that will do it, with a few exceptions. Um, uh, and that's because as, as you, as, as Webb is at L2, it orbits the earth around the sun. And so any given year, any given, you just move the window, right. But you would actually be able to observe any astrophysical object at least twice within that year, no matter what, no matter when the launch is. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for almost all astrophysical objects, that's fine. Right. I mean, it just, you may not get the window you had before, but you'll get another one within that year. Um, there's a few, a few exceptions, and that is solar system objects. Uh, so they really count on, uh, you know, if you're interested in a certain configuration, because they orbit at the same kind of time scale. Um, you know, you don't want, if you're observing uh, Uranus or Neptune or something like that, you, want them, or you don't want it to be behind the sun. You can't get to it, right? And so it'll be out of view for a while while it moves behind, behind the sun. So there's some solar system objects that, that have plans that may change. Right, right. Um, one of the sort of one of my favorite types of astronomy is this idea of multi messenger astronomy, you talked about observing a kilonova, but just this idea of various telescopes working together to observe the same object, sometimes at the same time, or sometimes at different times. Are there going to be some collaborations with James Webb and some of the other telescopes out there? Any of note? Um, so I, I, in, in the first year, in the first cycle, we've, we've tried to, uh, to keep that to a minimum just because, man, this is, this is complicated enough already. Let's, let's, <laughs> let, let, let's get, you know, let's get our bearings. Uh, but I, but I, I think in the future, definitely that's, it's probably going to be, be some, some programs like that. Uh, but I think for, for right now, it'll be incumbent of other observatories to, to match the, the, the JWST schedule if you want something that's really concurrent. Right, um, that, that makes sense, that makes sense. But I do feel like those, you know, you get those, these, these opportunities like the Kilanova and so on, and then maybe you will very much uh, shift over and, and, and take a look. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you have any other examples of, of, I mean, there, as you said, there's 400 in there. So anything else that, uh, that caught your eye as a, as an interesting target? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, so, so yeah, I mentioned that there's, there, there's some, so I think it'll be exciting solar system observations. You Let's talked see. about, uh, I mean, okay. So, so the solar system, you talked about observing Kuiper belt objects, things like that. Um, that's sort of a class of objects which are at the very limits of what we can see today. What are some other things in the solar system that are at the very limits of what we can we can see that maybe James Webb can help with? Right. I mean, for, for example, I mean, there's uh, there's a number of um, um, uh, observations that are associated with other NASA missions. Um, so. And actually, that goes back to your previous uh, previous question as well, like com combining with all the astronomical observatories. But there are there are synergies with, for example, with Juno on on, on, uh, on Jupiter, um, to combine observations with that with with spectroscopy of uh, of James Webb. And again, like because it's planets and they orbit and they they revolve, you have to you have to do that at the same time. So those those are, those are interesting. So there, there's a bunch of those that kind of thing in there. Um, there is, there's, oh, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the Kuiper Belt, right? I, I love New Horizons and Pluto. There's, uh, there's, there are programs to, to observe Pluto and the Pluto system, and to look at the climate of Pluto, um, and the, and the, uh, the cycling of its atmosphere. So again, we can, we can, we can do that remotely with James wow. Webb, even though we don't actually have a, um, an observatory. You'd be able to observe the, of it, but you the, the cycling of Pluto's atmosphere from roughly the you know from around earth so to that distance right yeah um uh mark kozoil 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 i sorry mark um asked in the chat about that that black hole um 
how will James Webb, will James Webb be able to, I mean, it's always thought of such a high energy, but then at far wavelengths, you know, high, narrow wavelengths turn into very wide wavelengths. So will James Webb be able to assist with black hole observations? Yeah, yeah. And, and there, are, there are some of those as, as, as well. Um, um, it will, in particular, it will look at, I think that there's a pro, at least one program um, that will monitor black hole, galactic black holes um, to, to look for um, the evolution of matter that is blown out as part of a jet, right? So you, you, can, you can have an event and in a black hole, you have something accreting all of a sudden through its accretion disk. And then you blow out some of the material in a jet. And whenever you do that, you have to kind of blow out. Yeah, you start out really hot, right? And you start out with, with um, uh, super high energy radiation, but eventually that cools. And as it cools down, um, you, you have additional opportunities to understand just not just the physics of the jet, but also the, the material that, um, that originally got accreted. Um, and so that programs to, so again, go out and if you look for these big, big outburst events of, uh, of galactic black holes, particularly if you have a black hole that's in a binary, like a, like a contact binary with another star, um, and then then try and understand much better the the, the process of accretion into the black hole and blow out. Yeah. Um, how many asks? Um, how will the vast amounts of image data be stored, and how publicly accessible will this data be? Right. Uh, good. Good question. Uh, so. So that is that is one of the things that that the space telescope we are contracted to do is to host the public archive. And it's the same with Hubble. Um, um, it's hosted at the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescope and NAST. Um, and so that's yeah, public to 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 all. Uh, some programs uh, will have what's called an exclusive access period of up to twelve months, where the um, the PI and, and their team get a chance to do the science. Um, so it'll take a year before the the data will be fully public in the archive. But uh, at my last count, I think at least at least 20% of the time in cycle one have no exclusive access periods. So for those, the data is actually public immediately in the archive. It includes all large programs. There's a number of programs called treasury programs. There's a set of programs called early release science programs. And there's some PIs who just say, oh, I mean, we, we, we recognize this, 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 this data is, 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 you know, it's public property. I mean, everybody, um, you know, paid taxes to have this, this, this yeah. observatory. Um, and so let's, let's make it free for all. Um, so at least 20%, um, it's just, it's a fairly large number. So I think you'll see public data in the archive pretty quickly. Yeah. I, I think people don't realize how much of this data is just there waiting for somebody to go and take a look at it that, <clears throat> and that a lot of the times the, you know, someone observed some galaxy back in the past, and then someone's got a new question about that galaxy. And because some, someone already observed that galaxy did s gather data about the galaxy, they can, they can add that to their paper and and it's just right they don't need time on hubble because the time has already been been taken and there's actually um there's a woman named uh, judy schmidt who goes and and takes old pictures taken by hubble and cleans them up and releases them to the to the public and a lot of the new beautiful photographs that we see are all these hidden gems that were captured by hubble over decades that nobody had just there's just so much that it just takes somebody to go in and look at it and go, Oh, this would be, a, this would make a nice picture. Right. Yeah. It's all available. I, I, it's all there. Yeah. And, and I hope, I mean, I, I hope, uh, uh, we'll, we'll see some, some, uh, you know, somebody from not just from the astronomical professional community, but, you know, for our amateur astronomers to say, go in and, 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 uh, uh, you know, see if we can make some images with, uh, uh you know, just beautiful images. Right? Yeah. because we, we we'll never get to all of it and you see you see also with the uh, even with hubble um i remember the exact number but i think it's like half the papers written for by hubble data now are archival i mean they're, they're they're written by people who didn't originally propose for that data set yeah yeah and and, and just sort of this idea of of old data being useful it's this legacy as you say this history of the archive that you can dig through find additional answers ask questions and the the data itself will just be able to give you the answer without having to task the telescope which you know saves you a little bit it drops the number of of extra hubbles from 20 down to 10 that you would yeah. that you would want um that's that's awesome um any any other 
any other, I know I'm, you know, it's hard to think of, you know, choose between your children, but, um, <laughs> you know, are there any other sort of interesting searches that, that James Webb is going to be doing that you think is, is, is going to be fun? Uh, yeah, but, so maybe one, one thing to note is that it, it's actually fairly easy for anybody who's interested to go and look through the programs um on online it's all on on jwst.stci.edu and you can just go on this on top navigation there's there's observing programs and there are easy tables that to look through of, of all the all the different programs and you can go and you can you can read the abstracts and you know see which targets they're they're looking at and you can even download the technical specifications if if you're so inclined yeah. um so yeah so it's uh it's just there's so much there yeah, it's it's interesting. There's there's even like um, there's Twitter accounts. I follow a Twitter account that tells me what Hubble is looking at and for who mm -hmm. and what location. And so you can you can literally and then you just you can see that and you can see you know you might recognize the names of the astronomers and then you you can see the um, uh, like you can recognize the names of the astronomers. You can see what they were working on and then and then later on you can see the paper and you could see that connecting up to the the observations that he made. All right, so I think the the big question I've seen this a bunch of times is is there anything how is the schedule looking right now to meet that that October 31st launch schedule? Where is the telescope right now? So the telescope right now is is at Northrop Grumman at Redondo Beach in California. Um, and that's where that's where it will stay until it's shipped off to uh, to French Guiana in South America for launch. Um, it's being packed up for uh, pre and prepped for launch at the moment. Uh, so they're basically done. Uh, uh, things are looking good. Um, you know, I haven't heard any any anything beside that. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, it's I, I'm getting. <laughs> you know, I'm getting a little nervous, right? Because uh, uh, you know, you can tell it's going to happen. And, you know, in the past, it's been sort of out in the future and you go like, yeah, yeah I mean, when we have launch, you know, we'll all be very busy and, you know, we'll, we'll be, you know, we'll, we'll have to be prepared, of course. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, far, far enough out in the future that, you know, it's not the same. Now I started to get this feeling of, oh, it's actually going to happen. Right. So, the, so the, <laughs> I just shake a little bit. Right. So the concerns that we have are things like a, a giant tanker getting stuck in the Panama Canal. <laughs> the the the, uh, the the standard launch delays that happen with a rocket because for, for whatever ne reason it needs to be scrubbed but not because you know like the telescope is now packed away and nobody's opening that up to to fix or check anything and so um yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So if people want to, I guess, follow, like, as you mentioned, you know, if they want to, like, look through all the programs for themselves, and see everything that's that's on the schedule, where do they go? So go go to our website for scientists. Uh, this is not on the public one. This is one the scientists use. Um, that's uh, at Space Telescope. That's at jwst.stsi.edu. Um, and so if you go there, uh, then in the, in the top navigation, it's called um, uh, under science execution, there's, there's a link called approved programs. And, uh, and in there, there are, there are lists of, of all the programs with the different categories. Right. You can uh, <laughs> browse at your heart's content. And if people want to uh, follow your work and what you're doing, uh, where should they go? Uh, you follow me on Twitter. Um, at uh, uh, at Pontopi, P O N T O P P I, um, it's probably the, the the best way. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and answer our questions, and uh, it gives us a much better idea of of what James Webb is going to be looking at when it first launches. Uh, and of course, you know, I mean, we have been make we've made so many jokes about about the launch of James Webb being delayed. But as we're getting closer, as you say, it's kind of getting a little getting a little nerve wracking. It's possibly our nervousness. And so here's to a smooth and safe rollout uh, boat trip and uh, and launch. I can't wait to see the first science coming from James Webb. So thank you so much right. for taking the time. Thank, to chat thanks, Fraser. It's been a hoot. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks, Take folks. care. Bye. Thanks, everybody.